Good evening. My name is Vera Pezer, and I am Chancellor Emerita of the University of Saskatchewan. I have the honor of moderating tonight's launch of a book that tells the story of one of Saskatchewan's most remarkable citizens, Sylvia Fedoric. The book, A Radiant Life, authored by Merle Massey, covers Sylvia's life from her early roots in rural Saskatchewan and her outstanding accomplishments as a student athlete at the University of Saskatchewan. Her graduate work, contributing to the design of Cobalt 60 for cancer treatment, led Sylvia to a career as a world-renowned medical physicist specializing in treatment of cancer. To learn more about the Cobalt 60 cancer therapy discovery at the University of Saskatchewan and its legacy, visit cobalt60.usask.ca. Sylvia's illustrious career culminated in her selection as the university's first female chancellor. Her work as a community volunteer contributed to her appointment as Saskatchewan's first female lieutenant governor. Saskatchewan and the university shaped Sylvia Fedoric, and she in turn had a profound influence on her province and her university. All three bettered each other. Let's turn our attention to a video highlighting Sylvia the person. Sylvia Fedoric is a Saskatchewan icon. A radiant life, the Honorable Sylvia Fedoric, scientist, sports icon and stateswoman, is her first full biography. A Radiant Life was written by Dr. Merle Massey, drawing on the Sylvia Fedoric funds held at the University of Saskatchewan Archives and Special Collections. It is published by University of Regina Press in 2020. As Sylvia would have wanted, this is a Saskatchewan story. The first strand in the braid of Sylvia Fedoric's life is as a scientist. She was a research technician on the university's Betatron program, then became a graduate student on the Cobalt 60 team, which built the world's first Cobalt 60 radiation therapy machine for cancer treatment. Sylvia's research calculated the depth dose to set the machine for maximum effect. She later led teams to build the rectilinear scanner and the scintillation camera, which were precursors to today's PET and CT scanners. Still worked on projects for the International Atomic Energy Agency and held a dual appointment throughout her career as physicist at the Saskatchewan Cancer Commission, which operated cancer clinics in both Regina and Saskatoon, and as faculty with the University of Saskatchewan. In 1973, she was appointed the first woman on the Atomic Energy Control Board of Canada. The second strand in the braid of Sylvia Fedoric's life is as a sports icon. While a student at the University of Saskatchewan, Syl competed at the InterVarsity and Dominion level in multiple sports, including track and field, golf, hockey, volleyball, and basketball, a total of 12 InterVarsity teams. In summer, Syl competed at the Baseball Diamond, an infielder with strength and agility with two different ball teams, the Regina Govins and the Saskatoon Ramblers. Sylvia is likely best known for her curling as third on three-time Saskatchewan and two-time Canadian championship curling teams with longtime friend, roommate and skip Joyce McKee. The third braid in Syl Fedoric's remarkable life is as a stateswoman, or more simply a leader. Her gifts and leadership led to two prestigious positions. In 1986, Syl was elected as the first female chancellor of the University of Saskatchewan. In 1988, Sylvia Fedoric was appointed as the first woman lieutenant governor of Saskatchewan. Syl called that appointment the highlight of her life. In addition to these three strands, A Radiant Life also showcases Sylvia the person and her incredible zest for life. Syl was a keen sport fisherman, enjoying more than 50 years of dedicated casting in northern waters. Syl loved music, which fostered several encounters with celebrity. Syl was the University of Saskatchewan Huskies' number one fan. And if she was in the stands, everyone, especially the refs, would hear her. She had an alter ego as fearless bird, Farkle, friendly photographer. Her archival collection boasts about 8,000 photographs, negatives and slides, along with compact discs and home movies. Syl had a passion for pickles, including her secret recipe for Syl's dills. The recipe along with her logo are included in the book. Trader Syl was a curling pin collector, constantly on a quest for new, unique or hard to find pins. 
In the end, her collection held over 6,000 pieces. Thespian Sill was always up for an impromptu skit, costume, or play, though in one memorable event, she missed part of her costume change and swanned on stage in a babushka and shirt, but forgot her pants. Sylvia Fedoric was gifted with her own coat of arms, which used, of course, a physics nuclear symbol. The annual Slobstick Tournament, all women, and a takeoff of the more sedate Lobstick Tournament at Waska Sioux, drew Sylvia as a regular to golf, sing, eat, and spend time with friends. In her lifetime, Sylvia Fedoric earned both a Saskatchewan Order of Merit and the Order of Canada. Though she never pursued a PhD, Sill's science, sports and statesmanship earned her five honorary degrees, the last in 2006, from her own university. Sill loved dogs and proudly owned three, first Tinker, then Charlie, then Max C. Though she set high standards for herself and others, those dogs ruled her household. In the end, her radiant and iconic life drew from one place. She was, quite simply, Sill. We are pleased to bring you a radiant life. A radiant life. Merle Massey, like Sylvia, has deep roots in Saskatchewan and the university. Her early life on the family farm led to the university and ultimately a PhD in history. A Radiant Life is Merle's third book. The first co-authored with Stuart Houston described how Sylvia led the journey to Medicare. <clears throat> the second, Forest Prairie Edge, using material from her dissertation, won a Saskatchewan Book Award in 2015. Merle currently works as coordinator for undergraduate research at the University of Saskatchewan. Merle will offer some comments and read from portions of A Radiant Life, following which you will be able to ask her questions. Thank you very much, Vera. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone who's here. I'll have you know that I have now officially lost my bet with Vera. Uh, we, we bet $2 that um, if there was more than 100 attendees, Vera, Vera would pay me $2. No, the other way around. If there was less than 100, Vera would pay me $2. If there was more than 100, uh, I would have to pay her $2. And I'll have you know, there are 102. So I will have to pay Vera $2. Don't spend it all in one place, Vera. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been quite a journey to create a radiant life and to and to become part of Sylvia's story in a very small way of being able to capture it uh, for you. And if you don't mind, I would like to read from you a couple of uh, passages. I've picked three short passages uh, that I'll read to you from the book, uh, which of course is right here. If you haven't had a chance to order it yet, you can order it through the University of Saskatchewan bookstore uh, through uh, McNally Robinson. They've been an excellent source and anywhere online, it's, it's available apparently around the world. So here's the first choice. This comes from Sylvia's life as a uh, student at the University of Saskatchewan. And this is part of her, uh, the fun that she had in her sports career. While the physics department was preparing to create medical history, Sylvia was creating history in varsity sports. Basketball and track and field teammate Hazel Braithwaite was also a hockey player. In fact, she was the playing manager of the Husky at hockey team. The team under coach Elmer Burley of the College of Engineering had a problem. Braithwaite announced to the chief, that's the University of Saskatchewan's newspaper if you don't know, announced to the chief that the team had a dire need of a netminder. Girls who are at all interested in playing between the gas pipes were asked to find Hazel ASAP. Maybe Hazel took a good look at Sylvia's toughness and strength and talked Sylvia into the position. Perhaps Syl watching Hazel take on two varsity sports at the same time decided that whatever Hazel could do, she could do too. Certainly hockey was a new sport for her and friends would later wonder if Sylvia could even skate. 
Certainly, the sports reporters expected not hockey, but a standout comedy feature. But Sylvia's competitive spirit rose to the occasion. When the Huskyettes opened their season on December 6, 1947, Sylvia, hampered by goalie pads and glove and stick and sliding out from the bench on wobbly skates, was between those pipes. The first opponent in the Saskatchewan Women's Hockey League was the Regina UCT Pats, and you could buy a ticket for the evening for a mere 25 cents in the Saskatoon Arena, which held 1,500 screaming and cheering fans in the stands. The game was described as scrambly and disorganized, but the girls made up for it with enthusiasm. Sylvia foiled a Pats breakaway and played a nice game in goal, even though it was her first time. Of course, she had an amazing sports career. And when she became Lieutenant Governor, people would ask, well, what was it? You know, why, how, how, why were you picked as Lieutenant Governor? And, and she never really knew. She didn't know if it was her Ukrainian background. She didn't know if it was her sports career. She didn't know if it was her science career or all of the things that she had done uh, throughout her work career, of course, being the first woman on the Atomic Energy Control Board or any of the other appointments that she had. But when she did become Lieutenant Governor, she threw herself into it with great passion. And that's where the next passage that I want to read to you comes. From the day that she swore her oath of allegiance and her oath of office, Sylvia put her life into overdrive. There couldn't have been a more prepared candidate. With great enthusiasm, she dove right in. Two days after her installation, Sylvia attended the City of Weyburn's 75th anniversary celebrations as her first official visit. The day had been long in the planning with feverish last minute adjustments, and perhaps more than a few silent prayers. Arriving in her long black limousine from Regina, she joined a cavalcade of antique cars bearing federal and provincial politicians and the mayor, led by a pipe band. Sylvia popped out of the limo to see over 2,000 people waving and cheering. The school children, she would later note, were particularly happy since her visit had automatically given them a day off. Following speeches and band music, Sylvia went on a walkabout amongst the crowd. As she chatted and visited, an aide asked one young boy, Who do you think this lady Sylvia Fedoric is? And the boy lifted an eyebrow with a knowing expression and breezily replied, Oh, She's the new left-handed governor. It was a splendid introduction for Sylvia to the joy and enthusiasm of crowds, the instant and warm personal connections, the many funny stories from each community, her stock stump speeches on education and goal setting, and the ceremony of her new office. Sylvia loved being the left-handed governor. She was left-handed governor for five and a half years from 1988 to the spring of 1994. But soon after she became Lieutenant Governor, this is where I want to read the third passage for you. Um, so in early January 1989, Sylvia was the secret guest on the hit Canadian TV show Front Page Challenge. Some of us are old enough to remember Front Page Challenge. That's not in the book. That's an aside. It was filmed on January 7th, but aired later in the spring. And she relished the back and forth question and answer banter. After the panelists, so Betty Kennedy, Holly Preston, Pierre Burton, and Alan Fotheringham, along with host Fred Davis, had finally guessed her identity. Burton fired off a series of questions about poker, which Sylvia answered with great fun, giving as good as she got. Others asked about her cancer work, her roots north of Yorkton, and how she got called to be the new lieutenant governor. And then Burton issued the last salvo. Pierre Burton. How many hands do you shake every week, Your Excellency? Sylvia Fedoric. Well, just a few days ago, I shook 998 hands during the New Year's Day levee from two to four o'clock in the afternoon. Pierre Burton. You have to have you have to have a technique so that you, so you don't put your arm in a sling. What is your technique? Yes, Sylvia said. The technique is you shove your hand in there first, and then they can't squeeze. I learned this when I was chancellor. I had my hand really bruised the first time. Laughter from the audience. Pierre Burton, so you break the other guy's hand before he can break yours. And Sylvia said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> we had a lot of fun here in our, in our household choosing what we were going to read for you. And, and uh, one of the things about Sylvia Fedoric is that 
she was very shy and modest in most of her in most of her ways. And in that very same uh, front page challenge, Betty Kennedy asked her, "Are you intending to do any writing?" And Sylvia said, "Not really." And Betty Kennedy said, "Because it seems to me that your whole life is something that that is a very interesting story." And Sylvia said, "Well, I'm keeping good notes." I want to end my reading here, but I wanted to say thank you. Yes, Sylvia did keep good notes and her archive. So I'm, I'm most grateful for all of this to the archivists at the University of Saskatchewan Archives and Special Collections. They were invited uh, by, by uh, Sylvia's executrix to come to the house uh, when Sylvia passed away in 2012 and go through the house and choose what they were going to, to take back to the university and keep as part of uh, Sylvia's archive. It's extensive. And of course, it is now part of the public record. All of her videos, all of her photographs, all of her all of her archival uh, record is all available to the public. And once the pandemic is over, I do invite you and encourage you, if you have a, a day that's free, go to the University of Saskatchewan Special Collections, Archives and Special Collections, and, uh, and spend some time with Sylvia looking through her life the way that I was allowed to do uh, it, it's such a treasure. Vera and I want to open up the, <laughs> that is, Jerry said, that is indeed the modesty and humor of Sylvia. Uh, it, it was, I, I found it at every turn as I was doing this book and, and it was, it was amazing. Vera, do you want to pop back on and put your video back on so I can see you too and we'll, we'll, we'll have our chat. If any, what we wanted to do, just to make sure that we're including everybody in the, in this in this evening's launch, is that if anyone has a particular question that they would like to uh, uh, to to give to us, if you can just look, look on the bottom right hand side of your computer screen, there's a little bubble. It looks exactly like what uh, uh, you it, it, in a cartoon. It's a little bubble. It says chat. Go ahead and click on that, and you can type in uh, any questions that you might have. Uh, either for Vera or myself. Vera, of course, actually uh, knew Sylvia personally, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Vera was uh, a great resource for me as I was researching and writing the book. In fact, Vera was one of the first people that I talked to, and I, I distinctly remember this. And Vera said to me, you need to make sure that you tell Sylvia's story, warts and all. <laughs> do you remember saying that, Vera? Yes, I do. <laughs> And I, I I took that to heart just just to make sure that that we don't want to set Sylvia, even though she was amazing and she deserves to be on a pedestal and you deserve uh, to think through her whole life, the scientist, the, the sports icon and 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 the stateswoman that she was at the same time, she was a real person. And we all have our, our little, you know, things that we do and our, our foibles and, and our ways of looking at the world. And we wanted to make sure that the book captured that as well. Which you did. <laughs> thank you very much. There is a question. What a great event. Thank you. Was there anything Sylvia was afraid of or worried about? Uh, yeah, there was there's one for someone who well, I'm sure there's more than one. But here's my favorite example. Uh, Sylvia was a wonderful sportswoman, but she was not a skier, not a skier of any kind in the in the 1950s. She actually was in Ontario at at a uh, Harold Johns's cottage and they, she tried skiing on the water and it was just an absolute disaster. She couldn't, she could not get her athletic body to do what it was supposed to do. But apparently about 15, 20 years later, she'd forgotten that event and her and Irene Bell, and I know that Irene is listening in, um, went downhill skiing. And I think Irene's quite a good downhill skier or certainly had, had some competency, but uh, Sylvia was determined to go downhill skiing, and I can't remember if you guys went to Jasper or Banff. I know I have it right in the book. And off you went, and Sylvia decided that she, was, she wasn't going to chicken out. She bought her skis, her boots, her poles, everything that she needed, and away she went. And up you guys went uh, to the ski hill and got to the top, and she fell off the ski lift at the top, and it was a complete disaster. She was so frightened, and so she could not master herself. She couldn't master the skis. There was no way that she was going to, going to get down that mountain. And this really iconic sportswoman was completely defeated by downhill skiing. And she did get down the mountain on the back of a snowmobile. <laughs> and then someone else said, Dill, she cried as she visited my hospital room because she was a softie too. It's true. We had, we had a, a one comment that came in uh, via... Um, 
email and I wanted to uh, read it for you out loud. It is no surprise to anyone that Sylvia was a multi-layered woman. One of my favorite stories is from a time I was hospitalized for several weeks and while friends brought me the usual flowers, puzzles, books, coffee, Syl brought me a jar of her famous Syl's Dills. They were scrumptious, of course, and I was asked if I knew about them. Not only did I know about them, I actually made myself uh, a jar. One of the things about Syl's, Syl's Dills recipe, and it's actually in the book, as well as her logo. I don't know if you can see it. I'll try and put it as close as I can. Can you see it fairly well? So Syl's Dills, the logo. I, I printed it up and I, and I posted it uh, or put it, taped it onto my uh, jar. Uh, it's really handy because you can make them one jar at a time. So buy the book and the recipe is there. And one other thing. Heather's and this, these comments come in from Heather. I don't know how many people know this, but she was a softie. More than once, I was witness to Syl's tears of pride and compassion. I feel lucky to have known that side of her. And Heather, thank you so much um, for, uh, for, for uh, sending in that comment. Anne asks, what's your favorite bigger story about Sylvia? Hmm. I'm not sure that, that Sylvia... I don't really have a bigger story. I do have a Rosetown story. And since I farm halfway between bigger and Rosetown, I'll, uh, I'll take Rosetown as, as, as close enough to my hometown, but she was there, she was Lieutenant Governor when they opened the new school in 1988. And uh, when I was down in Regina, uh, I went through the research files that they had at the Saskatchewan Archives in Regina and her original speeches, all of the speeches that she gave for all five and a half years that she was Lieutenant Governor are actually all kept. And so I, I took copies of the speech that she gave in 1988 at the opening of the high school uh, because uh, my husband and his two brothers went to high school there. And so it was a, a close connection then. I'm, there we go. So I just, oh, there's Penny Stoddard said, I just want to thank you for writing all the scientific information in such a way that anyone could understand it. My father is Trevor Craddock, who Trevor, by the way, was a huge help for me on the book. And although I know what he has done as a phys physicist, I never really understood it. So thank you. You're welcome. And Trevor, thank you so much. Penny and Trevor, both of you, uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Penny, I know that uh, Sylvia was your godmother, and so you're particularly welcome. I wanted to see if there was any more comments or questions that came in. There's one here from Elin AJ. What did Sylvia like to do when she was a young kid? Take things apart, actually. Uh, <laughs> she was very good at it. Um, it was it was a, a family story. So if there was a radio or if there was some kind of gadget or gadget, especially if it was anything electronic, Sylvia liked to take it apart. But what her skill was is that not only could she take things apart, she put them all back together in the right way with no parts or pieces left over. Actually, Sylvia, uh, when she came out of Walkerville High School, in uh, Ontario. So she spent four years, grades 10, 11, 12, and 13 at Walkerville High School in Ontario. Her parents went down to work there during the war years and she went with them. And uh, she won a $400 scholarship to go into the College of Engineering at the University of Toronto. And that is where she was going, except the war had ended. It was 1946. The war had ended. All of the returning soldiers were kind of taking over the jobs. And so her dad was going back to Saskatchewan to go back to being a school teacher. And they could not, her parents, she was an only child. Her parents really didn't want her to stay behind. And so they brought her back. And uh, and so instead she enrolled in physics at the University of Saskatchewan and, and sort of the rest of his history. But we almost lost her to engineering at the University of Saskatchewan, or at the University of Toronto. Yeah, the other thing she really liked to do as a young kid was uh, uh, was into sports. Like I, her, her great legacy that ended up at the University of Saskatchewan really began in the playgrounds when she was a young kid and, and at the school where her dad was actually the teacher. So she was into softball and track at a very young age and those interests really stuck with her as well. I don't know. I don't know if she liked this so much, but she told me that, uh, like, she ended up uh, being quite a good teacher, and uh, at the university, as, as you mentioned, with Stuart Houston. But her dad taught in a in a very large school with all eight with all eight grades, and so they would have forty or fifty kids in the school from grades one to eight. So by the, t the the dad's strategy, her dad's strategy was to teach, then move on and teach the higher grades. 
And then those in lower grades had to teach the kids that were lower than them. So by the time she was in grade four, Sylvia was actually teaching school. It's true. And so when one on my research trip to to Yorkton, I actually found Scotland school. And so I got a chance to go inside. Of course, it's all falling apart now, but it's it's still quite fascinating. I think there's there's this one massive room. And at the time when Sylvia was a student, her dad actually had about 70 kids jostling around in that in that one room, all the way from the big kids at the back to the very smallest ones at the front. And it's pretty it's pretty phenomenal to stand inside a one room school. Baby Hay asks, she said, Sylvia held many different roles in life. How did she impact what it means to be a scientist? It's kind of a fascinating thing. One of, one of the reasons that Sylvia became a scientist was because her supervisor, Harold, Harold Johns, and his wife, Sybil, had her over for supper at Christmas, and Sylvia was still in first year university. And they suggested to her that medical physics uh, would be a really good area for her to enter into because as a, as a woman, because it was so new that it didn't have this um, um, viewpoint that you had to be a man to be to, to work in this particular area of medical uh, of medical physics. And so still was able to really carve out a role for herself. So she finished her master's in 1951 and she got took a job with the Saskatchewan Cancer Commission. And her mom was her biggest supporter of making sure that she didn't go and do a PhD. Stay, you got a good job, stay with your good job. And so and so she did. And it was uh, she kept that role right until she retired in 1986. And it, it's what she showed and what she led was that you could be a fantastic scientist, a, 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 an academic of, of great renown, um, even in a remote place like Saskatchewan and even being a woman. She, she basically ignored any of those particular rules and just broke right through them. Any ceiling she not only just broke, she shattered and away she went. Jerry Batista said, I'm a retired medical physicist in London, Ontario, the competitor to Saskatoon and the Cobalt 60s story. My first published article was on a Fedoric radiotherapy device. I then trained many PhD students who earned three Sylvia Fedoric awards from the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency. This is a highlight of my career. I treasure my personal meetings with Sylvia, great personality and a motivator for success. Yeah, yeah it's a lovely story. That is a lovely story. I know that Harold Johns, uh, this was something that he did. He held all his other graduate students up against Sylvia was the stick and they were all measured against how they how well they stood up uh, to Sylvia. She was definitely the uh, the um, I, think, I think Sylvia's success was tied in many respects to a succession of men who put uh, very high standards on her that she had to live up to. It started with her father, actually. Yes. Because he was teaching her, and she told me that her father was determined that the rest of the kids in school would never see his daughter as the teacher's pet. And so in order to make sure that didn't happen, he was harder on her than he was on any of the other, um, any of the other students. And with many, with many other students, that might have been a problem, but in fact it became an incentive for Sylvia. So that just, that was the start of it for her, I think. Like everything she did, she had to do her best. And it kind of started with her dad. Then she got to the university. And as you say, her, her, her mentor in physics, he was very demanding too. When she got into basketball and sports, uh, the coach was very demanding. You can ask Peggy McCurcher. I've been saying, yeah, if Peggy McCurcher is around it. <laughs> he was a tyrant. And so, but she seemed to thrive. And so you have all these men as role models pushing her and pushing her and pushing her. I think it's quite fantastic, actually. It is. It is fantastic. Although it, it does remind me of the quote from her high school yearbook, things that you will never see. And the number one thing they said about Sylvia is that you will never see Sylvia taking orders from a man. <laughs> and yet she did from her dad, <laughs> John's, <laughs> and Ivan <laughs> King. But yeah, it was not easy for her. Karen, Karen Clark asked, um, what can Sylvia teach women today about leadership and working in teams? That is something that really should be emphasized because Sylvia always spoke about her work as being part of a team. And it doesn't matter if she was talking about the Cobalt 60 work or even when she was talking about her, her work as Lieutenant Governor. When she wrote in her diary at the at the very last day when, when the next Lieutenant Governor took over and they came 
to her house to take her flag down, her lieutenant governor flag down from in front of her house. And she was very sad. And she wrote about it as being, it's the end of a team. It's the end of the team that was her support network, that everything that she did, or that she was as, as lieutenant governor. So she always thought of herself as part of a team. Did she ever identify as a, as a feminist in any public way? Not to begin with. In fact, she was, um, most of her writing, she talked about, no, we don't need feminism. We just need everybody to, you know, always do their best and that kind of thing. But when she became chancellor, it became quite obvious that she was exposed to a lot of the research around the systemic issues around uh, women, particularly women in STEM. And so she actually did a fairly abrupt about face. And you can see it in her archive that she started to really promote women in science, women in STEM, she would um, made sure that she set up scholarships, she made sure that she went to any women in science events, she spoke at them, and she was a huge proponent of making sure that that women were supported to be equal to to men in science. After all, you know, in, in her first year of calculus class at the University of Saskatchewan, there were 70 men and one woman and she, she wiped the floor with those boys and had the best marks in, in the whole class. Um, Sean Perpick asks, were you surprised she turned out to be such a skilled stateswoman and diplomat when she was lieutenant governor and had to oversee the turbulence surrounding the end of the Grant Divine administration and the beginning of Roy Romano's? It was a fascinating story to find in her archive. Um, we were, so Sylvia actually kept very detailed notes. For those of you who don't know, in 1991, we had a conservative government led by Grant Devine, and it was in political trouble. It actually um, uh, was was about to be overturned on a vote of a uh, motion of confidence in the House. The division bells were ringing. They left. There was a filibuster. It was a big event. And uh, Grant Devine went and asked Sylvia Fedorik to not just dissolve the legislature, but actually to prorogue it. And so exactly what um, Trudeau just did a few weeks ago to prorogue and that completely stops everything that's happening in the background in the legislature and she was very angry about it and she wrote about all of these uh, issues in in her privately in her private notes and there's a whole file that's called the special warrants file and it's in her archive at the university and I was able to access that and, and kind of take take readers through all of that and, and you can you can tell how angry she was there was there was stuff that was uh, written in in um, um, all caps and underlined three times, and she was she was definitely very angry about some of the things that were that were going on. And so, it's not that I was surprised about her ability to be a diplomat, uh, simply because she had been on so many different boards, including on the Atomic Energy Control Board. And don't forget that throughout the 70s and 80s, the AECB uh, it's only a five member board, so she had a lot of say and sway on that board. There were a lot of um, major events happening around the world or especially in Canada you know there's Three Mile Island there were there were all kinds of things happening within the nuclear industry and Sylvia was kind of front and center on all of that so she certainly learned how to be a stateswoman and a diplomat in some of her um, pre previous leadership roles the AECB the Canadian Ladies Curling Association being another good example of her ability to be a stateswoman so no she was able to handle both Grant Devine and frankly Roy Romano look them in the eye and tell them exactly what she was thinking. She was good at it. Julie Sapsford says, hello from New Brunswick. What drew you to write about Syl? And what about her inspires you the most? Oh, these are good questions, Julia. Um, I, I, was, I came to the book by way of friendship. Most of you might know Dr. Stuart Houston, who's a Saskatchewan medical historian. He's also, he's the bird guy. Most people know he just published uh, Birds of Saskatchewan uh, that came out this spring. It's a huge doorstop book. It's massive. And uh, he and Sylvia actually taught together for 20 years. They called it the Stuart and Sylvia show. It was first year radiation physics at the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, so Stuart really wanted to write Sylvia's biography. And he was uh, a huge proponent of, of getting things going. And as, as Vera mentioned, he and I had uh, co-authored a, a few things together in the past. And so we started work together, but pretty soon it became obvious that I was doing all the writing and I was doing all the research and he was doing lots of cheering in the background. So that, that that's more or less how we how we continued. So, <laughs> so that's what, and what about her inspires me the most? I actually really enjoyed finding out a little bit more about, about Sill's, the reality of Sill's life, you know, the, the loneliness that she had towards the end of her life that she recorded in her day planners or the, the screw ups that she had. She was at an international conference 
uh, in, in Britain and the slides didn't work and, and how upset she was by that. And it, it, it made her more real to me. It may, instead of this wonderful icon and, and, and the stories that we get through the media, it made her more real to me. And uh, that's actually what inspired me is that even though she had her own battles and demons, for example, going to a conference where, you know, the, the, the things didn't work, she was able to, to push through that and, and just be herself and still have this amazing life in science in sports and, and in statesmanship. So I really liked that. Jerry says, I was a PhD student when Harold Johns was at the University of Toronto and Princess Margaret Hospital. He was a great mentor, demanding excellence and always getting to the root of the scientific problem. I think that's absolutely true. And yeah, it's it, it's been really fun. Are there any more questions that, that, that uh, anyone wants to come in? Vera, I'm doing all the chatting. What was your favorite Sylvia story? That's because you're that's because you're so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a Sylvia story that uh, that kind of captures her too, and it's not a, one that's direct to me. But uh, during my time in student services, uh, I worked a lot with students and student leaders. Uh, uh, the student president always sat on the board of governors during the term of that he or she was president. And so the one story that I heard actually from a student uh, that he told me about Sill was, uh, this was going to be his first meeting at a Board of Governors meeting. And he was very keen and very enthusiastic and wanted to make a good impression, so he got there early. And when he got there, Sill was already there. And anybody that knew Sill knew she was always on time or early. And she got very angry if anybody was late. So she was there and he was there, just the two of them. And so she said, I want to tell you something. And he thought she was going to impart to him something about the board or members of the board or, or kind of the protocol and, and what he could do. To... So he said, okay. And she said to him, you have to get here early or all the good cookies are gone. <laughs> she, she, had a, she had a quirky streak, that's for sure. <laughs> Barb Shea asks, do you know what Sylvia felt were the highlights of her life? I think that that's a, um, a really great question. And the fact that her archive is, is as extensive as it is uh, really showcases that, that Sylvia did see her life as, as um, she recognized the science, she recognized her impact on sports, and it actually was quite uh, a phenomenal impact, not so much on, on being on the team with Joyce McKee and winning the first official Canadian Ladies Championship, as cool as that is. Uh, but her work in the 1970s, when she was the president of the Canadian Ladies Curling Association, she actually was very adamant, and, and Vera has talked about this in, in her own book, uh, The Stone Age, the, the, that the women's curling deserved to be at the same level as the men's, and, and it deserved to have sponsorship, it deserved to have people coming, it deserved to have people watching. And so she worked really, really hard to make sure that, that what was happening in the women's uh, Canadian ladies curling was equal to what was happening over in the briar. And so she made sure that there were sponsorships and she kind of set it um, on the course that we still see it today at that very professional, very high level. And, uh, and so it, I would say that that's a major contribution that, that she made. She also knew that um, she had a huge impact on Saskatchewan as the, as the first really busy and very visible and well-known lieutenant governor. There's this whole long list of, of men who were lieutenant governor. And all of a sudden in 1988, we had Sill and everybody's like, wow. And, and she was pretty cool and she was very busy. And I know Gordon Barnhart, who was a, 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 a lieutenant governor after that, Gordon told me, and I believe he's here with us tonight. Gordon said to me, nobody else could ever keep up with the pace that Sill set. That it, it, she, she set this absolutely crazy high standard where, where she was, every everybody was uh, um, exhausted, and it still still would still keep on going, and and uh, yeah, so definitely she she changed the role of the lieutenant governor, made it much more visible, and uh, uh, initiated a few things such as the northern tour. So some of those were really happened. Yeah, it's it's quite fun. Um, the uh, another, how is she not more recognized in the world for her contributions to uh, nuclear medicine? I always think she is. I know the University of Saskatchewan has done a very good job of highlighting Sill's role on the Cobalt 60 team. Um, I don't know what it looks like in terms of name dropping inside any kind of um, textbooks, 
I'm not really sure. I'm not a medical, uh, I haven't studied medical physics myself. I'm a historian by profession, so. Yeah, uh, Jerry says, I witnessed her honorary degree presented by the University of Rest at Western Ontario. Her acceptance speech to the medical school was inspiring for all the grads. Her style was very down to earth. Yeah, she did. She loved to give those very down to earth and direct messages. Uh, Jordan asks, you cover some immensely complex topics in this book, and I'm wondering if you could please provide us with some further insights into your process as to what you decided to include and, ex and exclude and how you told Sylvia's story. What is your approach to these sorts of ethical quandaries and telling the warts and all, and what, adv what advice might I have for other researchers who are dealing with similar problems? I write about this a little bit in the introduction to the book. I actually stopped writing for about a year. And it's because I, I needed to really understand for myself the extent and the depth of, of one particular story uh, that, that is recounted in the book. And that had to do with a graduate student at the University of Saskatchewan who did an art installation in 1993. So it's in the middle of the AIDS crisis. This was, uh, Saskatchewan was still very riven by homophobia at the time. And his art installation attempted to out Sylvia as, as, as a gay woman. And, and then the, the, the chapter goes through the repercussions of that. So how the University of Saskatchewan handled it, how the government of Saskatchewan handled it, how the media handled it. So I think that this would be an example of the chapter that Jordan is looking at. And it took me a while to work my way through how to approach it and whether or not to include it because I didn't want it to overpower Sylvia's story. But the more I, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it didn't overpower Sylvia's story it really showcased how important she was to the university, to the, to the Saskatchewan provincial government and to the Saskatchewan media and, and, and how, um, how much she meant to them. And so it all, the story became a bit of a foil, I suppose, to sort of the, the scientist, the sports icon, stateswoman. It became a bit of a foil to showcase that that isn't just rote. It isn't just a listing of accomplishments. She actually had touched so many people in the province that this is what these institutions chose to do to support her. So I hope that that answered that to a certain extent. And what, and then Jordan asks, what advice would you have for other researchers who are dealing with similar problems? It's not an easy path. It wasn't an easy path for me. It, um, I worried about it. I asked uh, my own mentors uh, about what their opinion was and, uh, and received uh, a variety of, of, of thoughts on that. And I folded all of those in, but in the end, um, I, I, I listened to my mom. She was she passed away from cancer in 2018, and when I recounted sort of the the depths of the story and and all its permutations and combinations, and and the the, the repercussions of the story, she said, "It's because that was such a dark moment in Sylvia's life that her light shone so bright. You need to include it to showcase that." And I felt that mom really captured the essence of that. And so that's why I chose to include it. Others might have made a different choice and that's just fine. Everybody can, someone can come along and write another biography of Syl. <laughs> Maybe Vera will take that up. <laughs> the, other, the other thing I took away from your, your ch that chapter of yours, Merle, is that um, in some ways the, the decision um, was not answered, you know, whether she was a gay woman or not. And, and at the end, uh, you said that that was um, almost everything. You couldn't prove it, so so there's no point. The other thing I think that we need to all remember, and, and I knew this very personally from being around Syl at that period of time, she had a very difficult time dealing with this. But we have to remember two things. She was young and grew up at a time when values around um, those kinds of lifestyle choices were very different from what they were now. So for her to be upset would be very normal for her. And, um, and the other thing is that what happened to her was not of her own doing. She received bad advice. She, um, and she, she took bad advice and acted on it. And so she was a victim. And I think uh, the university was then pulled in and both of them were victimized by all of this. It raises a very interesting ethical thing about freedom of expression versus a person's right to privacy. And my own, my, you know, I think that still struggled with that too. And I appreciate that you, that you showcase that because that, that's exactly how I, 
phrased it, you know, in the book and, and showcased it that that this is a complex issue. It's a complex chapter. Um, and and there and there's a lot going on with it. And it and it people react to it in various ways. And and I welcome that. I welcome people to, you know, send me an email with their reaction if they wish or or um it, it's up to you. I know my mother in law and I, we've been having various conversations over it. She reacted very strongly to it as well. But uh, in the end, I think that she that she that uh, she'd be a great example of someone who um, understood why I included it and and what it what it helped to showcase. And yes, I, I, exactly what Vera said to that. Syl spent her whole life, her whole working life, um, in in places and times where where even if she had been, even if her files in any way indicated that she that she was in fact a gay woman, there was. There was no way for her to have ever expressed that had she ever been. So it it it's in the end, it's really a, an ambiguous question, and uh, and I choose to leave it at that. Daniel asked, were there any pieces of Sill's life that remain a mystery to you? Anything that remained unresolved or elusive that you would love to complete? Are there any lessons from Sill's life that you would incorporate into your own life personally? Well, that's two separate questions, but those are good ones. Um, one of the areas that I didn't get a chance to explore as thoroughly as I would have liked is Sill's role on the Atomic Energy Control Board. She was the only woman, she was the first woman and the only woman for most of the, her time on the board. And I wasn't able to travel to Ottawa. Again, my mother was was uh, quite sick with cancer and so I, choose, I chose not to uh, travel to Ottawa. But she, uh, there are, I think those files are ripe for some additional research and some additional work. So I definitely had some questions around that. There's all there's some stories going around Saskatchewan that uh, she actually um, created some. She was an inventor, of course, and she created some some pieces that were um, used across Canada in various nuclear reactor facilities. And so I would have liked to have seen a little bit more about that and see if that was actually true or if that was just a rumor. So um, that's definitely an area that I would have liked to uh, explore a little bit more. Any lessons in Sill's life that um, um, I would like to incorporate into my own life? I think that being odd and being, you know, and having these kind of quirky things, like whether it's Sill's dills or whether it was uh, her, her penchant for collecting curling pins or, you know, that that that's that we should all embrace our, our, our um, quirkiness. I think that that would be a big lesson that I have from, from Sill. Embrace your quirkiness. And the second one is Sill always said, if you set a goal for yourself, then you actually can see that you're working towards a goal. And I think that that's an important um, piece of advice for any of us, no matter what position that you have. Uh, Bev said, is there anything you came across in your research where Syl talked about a hard choice she had to make and how she made that choice? Um, just to dive back into that particular chapter again, one of the things that we discovered, or I discovered as I was going through Syl's files is that um, the, the, the crux of, of the matter were two letters, one that, that this graduate student wrote to Sill, and then one that Sill wrote back on Government House um, uh, stationery. What I discovered is that Sill didn't actually write that letter. The letter was written by the Attorney General's office in, in the Saskatchewan Attorney General's office, and then of course Sill signed it. And so the choice I think that, that she made over whether or not to send that letter was an interesting one and a, and a tough one. And, but, I know why she sent it, and that's because the letter that came from the graduate student is filled with pain. You can, when you read it, as tough as the letter is to read, you can hear the pain that he was going through at the time, how many friends he had who had been dying of AIDS, and and the the anguish that he that he felt. And so you could you could see that she sent the letter back, hoping to, in some way, meet that meet that pain where he was, um, and that definitely was a difficult choice, but. Uh, and it didn't go the way that she had originally intended, but there she is. Um, Suzanne asks, I, th I think it's interesting that Sylvia stepped away from feminism as a scientist, where her physical existence was quite radical, without adding a political overtone. Yeah, Sylvia was never political. Once she had the space to address these issues as chancellor, her physical presence was no longer a radical statement. My observation is that this is not a unique experience for people in fields where there's a large gender imbalance. It should not necessarily be interpreted as anti-feminism, but rather that the bandwidth is full. As a non-historian, I'm curious to know whether this distinction is better understood now than it was when I was a student in the 90s. It's possible, Suzanne. I think that for those of you who don't know, Suzanne is actually the Dean of Engineering at the University of Saskatchewan. So thank you for joining us today, Suzanne. Um, 
it's it's a fascinating question. Syl herself, she never marched in any, not that I'm aware of, she didn't march in any of the uh, um, events in Saskatoon around, you know, women's march or, you know, bra burning or that kind of thing. She certainly did cut her hair and, and she was very, uh, it was fascinating in her files where she had this long flowing hair and obviously had perms and things like that. And then that's it. She cut it all off that and she really kind of reinvented herself in about 1966, 67 and, and had this very pixie haircut that she kept for the rest of her life. Um, and and so it, it was almost that she that she set this persona for herself of being very, um, very no nonsense, very work focused, very, very uh, work oriented, um, very direct. And whether that's feminism or anti-feminism, I don't know. And but it's it's uh, it, it was quite fascinating to watch her through her own files and and to see that change that she had. And you can see it when she became chancellor. She stopped being kind of that anti-feminist and realized that that there that there were systemic issues that were holding women back. And she, with her usual attack the problem style, went right out and started to attack that problem as best as she could. Merle, I think uh, if we if we could just take one more question and then we would wrap up the program. Do you have a question there? I'm just taking a look to see if there's anything. Oh, uh, Alric asks, you've talked a lot about the positive aspects of Sill's life. Are there any hi hidden darker parts that you would like to share? It's it's been. It was noted, of course, in the on-campus news story of research profile and imp that research profile and impact that Syl did have a propensity to over imbibe um, every once in a while. In her files, what 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 you would see is that she had um, events that she had that were planned, long planned in some cases, and and she had uh, um, binges, I suppose, and and oftentimes they had to they coincided with other things that were going on in her life, and also because she drove herself so hard that I think she just needed to give herself a break and and calm that side of her down. And alcohol would be a classic way to do it. I know my own father certainly did that. Uh, he would calm his own brain down using that at, as, a, as a bit of an escape. It wasn't, it's not an uncommon thing. I don't know if that's necessarily darker. I actually found that to be a very um, important part of understanding her personality to know that someone who drove herself that hard also allowed herself these times where she could just let go and i thought we can we can be judgmental about that or we can just be honest and say that this was a complex woman vera did you want to say anything to that <laughs> no, I, no i no i i agree with you i think she was a complex woman she was quirky certainly <laughs> and she had um she had moods, you know, like we, we, if we, if you read historical figures at all, uh, Winston Churchill had his dark days. Sylvia had dark days. I can, I can, you know, and I can remember her, she just didn't want to communicate or didn't feel like communicate. And I think someone as, you know, as, as driven and as, uh, and, and once you're that driven and once you're successful, uh, you can't ever let up so because you can't appear, appear to be less successful. Once you reach a, a degree of success, it becomes very hard to back off and say, oh, it's okay to be less successful. So the, a person like Syl ends up being driven. And that's very hard. That's a very hard way to live. And it it explains some of her behavior, the tendency once in a while to over imbibe, but also her moods sometimes. So... Uh, she was certainly cheerful and happy and very social, and that carried her well in her role. But there was another side to Sill's personality as well that we knew. And I think that just, it's not a bad thing. It just captures her as, as a person and as a complete person. And so... It was important for me as, as I kind of worked myself through Sill's life, my daughter at the time said, oh, I don't think I would have liked her mom. She's far too perfect. And and it's not that I kind of set out to find these sort of other sides of Syl, but to me, it, it helped me to understand that every, all of us is a whole person and all of us have these darker areas and these lighter areas or our public faces and our private faces. And, and as a biographer, it's one of those things that we have to sort of balance both sides. If you tell a biography, if you write a biography that only tells the one side, it, it just doesn't, 
you, you realize that the other half is missing and it just feels incomplete. The last question that comes in is, what, what will your next creative project be? Uh, I'm assuming that's for me. And uh, actually, I'm hoping that my next co-author, Les Oystrick, uh, from Creighton is on. Uh, Les and I are planning to write a coffee table book with lots of pictures about overland freighting in the north. So uh, all the horses that used to go take all kinds of things over the through the bush and across the frozen lakes, you always have to take things up to in, in northern Saskatchewan, northern Manitoba, northern Alberta in the wintertime. So we have that book planned and uh, we're working on it and hopefully you'll see that within the next oh, year to 18 months. Okay, so we can look forward to another book launch. Yes. Just before we wrap up, is, do you have any concluding comments you want to make? No. I just want to say thank you to everyone who was able to uh, be here with us today. David Parkinson says, enjoyable as the whole launch have been. And uh, the last few minutes of your presentation entered an area of humanity and insight that was especially valuable to hear about. And Donna said, it was so interesting and well done. I moved to learn a little bit more about Sylvia. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, please go out, uh, order the book online. Go, if you happen to live, if you live in promotion. Yeah, that's right. Now's the promotion level. Yeah, go buy the book. I promise you it's very good. Uh, I did my very best. I gave you everything I had. I And Sylvia always gave everything that she had. So between the two of us and, and supported by Vera, um, we, yes, Amazon, McNally Robinson, you can order it online anywhere. You can physically go to Saskatoon. They have them at McNally Robinson. They have them at the University of Saskatchewan Bookstore. Anybody who lives in rural Saskatchewan, in West Central Saskatchewan, you can drive to Bigger uh, because my very good friend Tina Zagary owns uh, the, the, a shop downtown and she has the books there. And uh, yeah, so please buy the book and uh, enjoy learning a little bit more about Sylvia. I promise we did not tell all the stories. Okay, well, th thank you very much, Merle. This concludes the launch of A Radiant Life and what I hope for you has been a radiant evening. Congratulations to Merle for authoring a well-researched, well-told story of the life of Sylvia Fedoric. Congratulations to the University of Regina Press for publishing this important story of one of Saskatchewan's heroes. We are grateful to the University of Saskatchewan for producing this podcast and tonight's virtual launch. And finally, thank you to all of you for joining us for this evening for a life to learn to, sorry, to, for joining us this evening to learn more about a life well lived and a book well written. Thank you. Thanks, Vera. And thanks everyone for coming.